My name is Sarah Crawford, and I'm a Residence Director at IEPUI in Indianapolis. I'm starting my second year at IEPUI and my fourth as an entry-level professional and work in a P3 building. We currently house some students in a hotel close to campus and will be transitioning these students back to campus next fall. I first got involved in Glucuho in grad school in 2007 and love having the opportunity to continue my professional development by assisting with this webinar. I will let Rachel introduce herself and then we will get started. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Aho and I'm a residence director at DePaul University in Chicago. Um, I work primarily with our first year students on campus uh, in two of our buildings there and have a wonderful student staff uh, that I get to work with as well. Um, I also work with our professional staff training which is kicking off this week so uh, for those of you who may be uh, in the midst of that or kicking off training, uh, welcome. Uh, we're excited to be able to talk to you all uh, today about preparing for a new year. Uh, and setting up for that success. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Rachel. For those participating, as Dina had said, please feel free to utilize the chat bar and ask questions for our presentation. We encourage participation as webinars are beneficial when they're interactive. Thank you again, Dina, for moderating our session. We are super excited to share our strategies that have worked for us. Let's jump right into our learning outcomes. A lot of these are self-explanatory, however, very beneficial to know what we'll be discussing this afternoon. We're going to discuss why expectations matter and how they affect our daily work. Also, we'll be working through different elements to consider when writing your expectations. Rachel will touch on this later, but we often assume our staff knows what they're doing, when in reality they don't have a clue. They need guidance and structure. A lot of this may seem like common sense. However, common sense is not common knowledge. We'll also look through how to involve others in setting expectations and how that creates buy-in and consistency. This includes considering talking with your peers, your supervisors, your student staff, and your department. Continuing, continuing with our next learning outcomes, we'll discuss more common expectations for student staff and distinguish how these expectations align with your own supervision philosophy. Our last objective is to understand how to create expectations that are informative, tools that, will, tools, that, tools that will create accountability, and can be utilized on a year-round basis. Thank you again for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel so we can dive right into our webinar. All right, so before we uh, begin talking uh, to you all about some of those practical strategies that Sarah mentioned, um, and really talking about how to formulate your expectations, we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why we're having this webinar in the first place and what the importance is of discussing expectations. Um, so what's the point, essentially? Um, in our jobs, uh, as you can see here, we all know that there's expectations of us, whether or not uh, those are formally written out or whether they're the unvoiced expectations that uh, we bring to the table at our institution. And so really spending the time to do some of that reflection uh, is is really important to help us inspect what we expect. Um, if we're requiring our student staff or someone to do something, it's really important for us to be able to take ownership of that, uh, to be critical and to follow up. And I think a primary example of this um, is, is bulletin board deadlines. Uh, Sarah and I were preparing for this and talking about, you know, if we expect our RAs to change out their bulletin boards on the first of every month, uh, by midnight, how are we truly following up on this? Um, how many of us are getting out of bed um, at midnight and walking around our halls uh, and making sure that those bulletin boards are completed? Uh, perhaps 9 a.m. is a more a realistic deadline. And so taking that time uh, to be critical, uh, to look with a keen eye at what we're doing, uh, is really important uh, on an annual basis and ongoing throughout the year as well. And so it's important that we take some of that time today uh, to really think about those things. As Sarah said also, we often assume our staff knows much about what we expect of them um, when they don't. And so making clear expectations is crucial um, if we're going to be able to hold our staff accountable uh, throughout the year. And if we want to uh, really show value to our departments as well, as well as I'm guessing most of our departments across the board value some level of fairness and consistency. Uh, we operate in the gray a lot uh, within residence life, but having that level of fairness um, and those expectations uh, can really help us 
in, in our position. And like I said earlier, uh, our expectations are there whether or not we want them to be. Our students are also coming in with those expectations. Society has expectations of them. And so it's really important uh, that we spend the time uh, to do that reflection. Uh, Robert Keegan, uh, in his book, o In Over Our Heads, The Mental Demands of Modern Life, uh, really talks a lot about how those expectations are embedded within our society. And so by helping us talk about them um, and making them as clear as we can, we can really help our student staff uh, both feel that challenge and support. Um, and help them develop the capacity to be successful in what they're doing. And so that's part of why uh, we're spending this time together today. Two, two other reasons uh, why we're really wanting to dive into this conversation is because expectations also help with that relationship building component. Um, building up that common purpose and giving your staff time to talk through um, some of those uh, team building elements, some of that norm setting that happens in the beginning of the year. And so having that common purpose is also a great way to motivate your staff uh, to give them something to latch on to um, and strive towards throughout the year. And really uh, give them a feeling that they're in this together. Have that buy-in as well. And lastly, we, we all want to have a great experience. Uh, we want our staff uh, and ourselves to have that positive experience when we're working throughout the year. And so research has actually shown that when those expectations are clear and when they're met by employees, uh, they physically and mentally feel better about their positions and the, way, the work they do. Uh, our staff are able to see where they fit in, they're able to enjoy their job, and all around uh, we're able to have a more positive experience by laying out those expectations. So those are a couple of reasons why you know it's worth your while to really make that a part of your your practice throughout the year to, to think about expectations, not only at the beginning of the year, uh, but throughout the year and making them last as well, which is something that we'll talk about. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah to talk about uh, some of the variety of ways that we can actually utilize uh, expectations in our work. Thank you, Rachel. So we set expectations throughout the entire process, including recruiting, hiring, and training staff. At IEPUI, we hold information sessions for our student staff candidates and give them examples of the roles that they will play if hired. These examples are community builder, programmer, role model, leader, and team player. Before we hire here at IEPUI, we cover the position details in staff class. Staff class is where we get to know our alternates and our new hires for the academic year. We look at values, ethical decision making, and connect them to our department. This is important for them to know what they're getting into, as it's a big role that they're about to take on. We have them read through their contract and really discuss their roles during this time. While in staff, while in staff training, we set expectations across all, le all levels. Rachel will discuss this later. We use expectations in one-on-ones. One-on-ones are important for accountability. The individual attention with your staff provides for an opportunity to discuss met and unmet expectations. We all often know the phrase, critique or correct in private, praise in public. If you're able to stop habits from forming before they're caught, this allows your expectations to work year-round. By having meaningful conversations, you can discuss things that are relevant with your staff. This gives a better understanding of what's going on for them, which gives you an opportunity to foster growth, thus developing them as a student and a staff member. We use expectations with our staff for follow-up, accountability, and job performance. Examples include, if, like Rachel had said, requiring the bulletin boards. Are they really going to be done at midnight? Are you checking them at midnight? If you are, that is fine and great. But if you're really going to check them on that Monday morning at 9 a.m., make sure they know this. Rounds. So how are you having your conversations with your student staff about duty performance? Is this outlined in your expectations? So for instance, going from your top floor to your bottom floor, or going around the building, how is this set out for your staff? This way, if you have it set in your expectations, they can succeed. Weekly reports. Again, we use these to guide ourselves and guide the students that we supervise. Are you checking them when you say they're in by 8 a.m. or they need to be in by midnight? 
Utilizing all these resources helps your expectations guide your evaluations and assessment. You want to make sure they're realistic and purposeful. Stop paying attention to when you enforce the expectations and when you don't. Nothing should come as a surprise when you evaluate your staff in December or the spring. You can allow these expectations to serve as your foundation to help with job-related decisions. This is important in correcting problems or miscommunication when you have to document something to help guide these conversations. I'm turning it back over to Rachel to discuss considering in the writing process with stakeholders. So obviously we use uh, expectations in a wide variety of ways uh, within our practice. And so before we can actually do that, uh, we need to actually comprise them, sit down, uh, type them out, draft those up. And so there's a variety of things uh, that you can truly take into consideration um, when looking into that writing process. And the first and foremost thing uh, that you really should consider are all the stakeholders at play. Uh, that includes you, your supervisor, your department, um, and most importantly, your students who are going to be getting that message from you. Um, when you embark on this process, um, before you even put any words to paper, um, you should really do some self-reflection uh, yourself. I know that uh, we often don't make the time to do that reflection, but taking that time uh, to really consider what you personally value, or what you want from your staff, um, and whether or not your values align with your institution values uh, is very important as well. Hopefully you've uh, chosen to work at an institution or have been lucky enough uh, to work at an institution where those values are closely aligned so that you're able uh, to truly uh, put together a set of expectations that reflects you and reflects your professional identity um, in going forward. Uh, and a great example, I think, of uh, personal expectation, setting one of those non-negotiables for yourself is talking about personal balance. I know balance is that uh, buzzword that we throw around a lot, but perhaps for you it's, it's very important not to receive any non-emergency phone calls after a certain hour uh, in the evening, or you have certain expectations around how you want your staff to communicate, email, text, um, those type of things. Write that down. Uh, take that into consideration so that uh, your staff knows uh, from the beginning of the year how you would like them to communicate with you. Beyond yourself and setting out some of those uh, personal expectations, it's also important uh, to talk with your supervisor about your expectations as well. How hands-on are they going to be? Uh, how hands-off? Is that something that you talk to them uh, together about? Um, is that something uh, that they're going to play a part in. Especially if you're at a new institution, it could be very valuable uh, for you to be able to uh, talk with them about these expectations so that you can make sure that your expectations meet those HR guidelines uh, that are out there and so that later on if you need to hold one of your staff members accountable, uh, you have your supervisor behind you who already knows those expectations, who can advocate for you to make the choice that you need to make when holding those staff members accountable. Uh, beyond your supervisor, it's also uh, beneficial to have some of these conversations amongst your department as well, uh, as many of us probably have common expectations across the board. Um, I think a, a perfect example of this is uh, checking in, calling in for duty. If your department requires uh, each of your student staff members to check in for duty at a certain time. You know, yeah. is that a universal expectation that you can hold, uh, that you can create some language uh, throughout your department together so that you're having that consistent message in each of your expectations for your RAs? Obviously, uh, each of our areas are unique um, in some ways, and they can't always be consistent. However, there probably are some of those core pieces uh, that you can talk about. So making that time maybe after this webinar at some point during your professional staff training to talk with your fellow colleagues about that could be a very beneficial way uh, to create some consistency across your department. Um, and lastly, uh, obviously the students who are going to be receiving these expectations are important to consider as well. They're coming in holding those expectations whether or not they're a returning staff member, uh, they are coming from a new area to your area this year, um, and they've heard about your uh, supervision style from uh, someone else, 
or their brand new staff member, it's important to recognize that there are going to be those expectations from them. And so involving them in that process of setting expectations is really important. And leaving room for that to happen uh, when you're writing is also vital. So we'll talk a little bit later about some practical strategies uh, for doing that. Um, but it's, all, it's important that when you're doing that reflection period uh, that you're incorporating your students as well. Beyond uh, the stakeholders, uh, there's also the nitty gritty of actually sitting down and beginning to write out your expectations. And some things to consider here are timeline, context, and format. Um, first and foremost is when. When are you setting out those expectations? Uh, Sarah mentioned setting out expectations during training. Uh, do you start early or do you wait uh, to provide your expectations? Literature shows that getting expectations out as early as possible uh, can be helpful in helping our students prepare to succeed. So how does your institution do this? Uh, during your recruitment season, perhaps you're setting out those expectations about required GPA, uh, time commitment, uh, judicial standing, those type of things. Um, and then building on that later, whether or not you have summer orientation, uh, you send out communication to your staff members uh, in the midst of them uh, getting started, or uh, when they come in the fall, uh, when we're obviously getting into some of those more job-specific expectations. So how are you kind of parsing those things out along the way? And also being careful to balance providing them early with providing too much information. So that's something to consider of how your department and how you are currently doing that with your staff. Uh, this kind of brings us to that next point of context, too. What, what expectations have you used in the past, um, and what are you using this year? Um, are you going to make any changes, especially if you're coming into a new position, or this is your first time, uh, maybe you're a graduate student, entering into that expectation writing process? Um, it's really important that those reflect you. Um, I know for new professionals it can be very tempting when oh, there's a lot of tasks to check off to take our past expectations from our supervisors or from uh, the year prior uh, to really uh, just copy paste those. However, really thinking once again about your context, where you're at now. Are you at a new institution? Are there new expectations across the board? How can you talk to your colleagues to make sure that those are consistent and that they're working for where you are now? Um, I think a, a great way of kind of showing how this might change um, is really thinking about the type of institution you work at. If you're at a mission-based institution, for example, uh, De like DePaul University where I'm at, uh, service is very important. So how, how are you able to weave that in? Uh, for me, it's weaving in a service uh, based component into our programming requirements um, or something like that. Is sustainability important to your institution? If so, how do your expectations reflect uh, those main tenets of, your, of where you're working and of your department? So something to consider as you uh, really think about where you're at now and how you can build upon uh, what you've used in the past. And then there's the nitty gritty. Um, of actually figuring out how to format your expectations. Um, I know a common question is, is how long should my expectations be? Uh, one page or five pages? Should they be bullet points? Should they be detailed? And to tell you the truth, there's not one right or wrong answer um, in doing that. It's really about however you can best communicate uh, that information to your staff and get the message across in a way that works for you and in a way that works for the context in which you're in. Um, in general, being more specific may not be bad if that information is delivered in the right way. Um, you know, Robinson, Burns, and Gaw uh, state in some of their uh, scholarship that really students just need to know those behavioral norms and limits. Uh, that helps them to resolve that uncertainty and frees them up from uh, needing to expend energy on trying to figure out the rules. So as long as your expectations are freeing them of that and allowing them to spend energy on the things that matter, such as spending time with their residents on their own academic endeavors. Um, that's the important thing in this. Um, in formatting, to give you some ideas, you know, we have seen expectations as we've prepared for this that are based on themes, uh, maybe 
three or three to five themes uh, to help your staff really remember and resonate that. Um, or it can be very detailed so that if you need to hold a staff member accountable down the line, you're able to go back and reference uh, that direct point. So it's truly up to you, but perhaps spending that time up front to be clear about uh, those expectations and to figure out a way from you for it, you to make that work uh, is really important. And so that's part of that reflection period and considering all these things as you embark on that writing process. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about some common expectations uh, that we have seen uh, throughout the field to get you thinking about a starting point for yourself. Thank you, Rachel. So our first slide in discussing common expectations is some that we came up with ourselves. The second slide I will talk about in a minute has a few from our feedback that we received from social media. Communication is a common expectation when working with student staff. The question to ask yourself is, what do you expect of your staff? For instance, when they're talking with residents, you as a supervisor, the director of housing, or the president of your institution. How often do you want them checking their emails? Daily, twice a day, or weekly? Does your institution provide them with a phone for their room? Does this include voicemail, and do they need to check that voicemail? Is it a cultural expectation that they text or use social media with you, your department, or even their residents? How often do you want them interacting with their residents? Remember, you want them to be friendly, not friends. Duty, programming, one-on-ones, staff meetings, and weekly reports. These all go into expectations. How do you explain these things to your staff? Kind of as Rachel had discussed before, do you go in detailed, or do you do a generalized overview of all of this? If you don't want them texting in your staff meetings, do you have them put their phones away, or do you make a no-phone rule during this time? Again, when you're requiring them to turn in their weekly reports, do you, read, do you read these on Monday mornings? Do you track their growth? Do you utilize this in their one-on-ones? Because if you're not using these items, it's not necessary for them to do this work. How are you inspecting these things that you're requiring? The more detail you give, the better your staff can understand and meet your expectations. We use the term fishbowl. Everyone lives in a fishbowl when they live in a residence hall. What do you expect of your staff to show their residents? What kind of behavior, study habits, their hygiene, their social life? You have to let them know that everything is being watched. For example, the red solo cup picture on social media. It may not have alcohol, and they may be in a crowded room, but to everyone else, they were drunk. So really discussing these things with your staff to make sure they know what expectations are there within their personal and professional lives. Do you have expectations for how your staff participate outside of your department? So for instance, hall council and committees could totally be involved in your department. However, involvement in other areas. So do you allow them to work on campus or off campus? Are there select hours or places of work or limitations that they need to know about? Going back to committees or hall council, is this something your department requires for them to participate in? Is this a job description? Or is a personal expectation because there's a difference and they need to know? This is what's in, why it's important to have a uniform expectation, as Rachel had mentioned previously. The last one on this slide is being good to your teammates. This is something I've learned from my current supervisor. If you're good to your teammates, they will be good to you. Community is something that we expect for them to build on their floors, and this is also what we want them to build amongst themselves. You can't teach or build community unless you are a part of one. Rachel and I had utilized Twitter and social media uh, for some common expectations. We had asked on Twitter and Facebook, we've all heard the interview questions asking the three expectations, what would you hold your staff to? Renee Dowdy emphasizes accountability and communication. Molly Rockefeller is looking for honesty in their obligations. Kelly Carter wants her staff to know and respect boundaries of others. Mine personally is productivity timeliness, and communication. This is the part for audience participation. What are some of these that resonate with you? Zena, if you could summarize some of the questions coming in, if there's comments, we can wait a few seconds to see if there are any responses.
it looks like we have um, Jennifer Prince has said that communication is a um, big expectation for her as well, as well as Sean Johnson, who contributed that honesty about academic obligations is important um, and big on honesty in general about any obligations that staff members have. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for your participation. Rachel, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah, as we continue, if there are other common expectations, feel free to write those in, as I think a lot of times uh, it's very valuable for us to share uh, that type of information. It gets us uh, thinking and gets us um, our minds kind of going about uh, some new directions that we can go. Um, I think uh, another way of us uh, doing this is to involve our students, as I mentioned before. Our students often come in with those expectations that we haven't even thought of. Um, before and so it's a really good practice um, to figure out a way that works for you to involve them um, in that. Um, so it, as you involve your students um, kind of in that process, I'm sure many of you have different uh, techniques that you've done that, but um, really the goal is to give voice to their experiences, to give them a space to talk about those things that they're worried about, those things they're concerned about and not just about uh, themselves and their job, but about working with each other, about how to work through conflict uh, as a team, and even about you as a supervisor. And that can be difficult to create an environment uh, that really feels safe um, for them to voice some of those things. And so that's why it's important, as we'll talk about later, to revisit expectations. As during the beginning of the year, uh, we all know that uh, people are, are trying to get along and trying to put on their best face. And so that conflict may not come up until later. But a good way to get that started, we wanted to provide you with one practical example of how you could set expectations utilizing your staff members is a simple posted expectation uh, setting activity. All you simply need are three different uh, colors of post-it notes. And all you can easily do this in an in-hall staff meeting during training uh, or during one of your first staff meetings as well. Uh, simply have your staff write down on one color the expectations that they have of each other. Um, on another, the expectations that they have of you as their supervisor. And on the last one, the expectations that they have of themselves. And that can really get them started thinking about the goals that they'd like to set uh, throughout the year as well. After you have them uh, complete that, it's really beneficial to have them post those on the wall or somewhere throughout the room so that they can look at them. They can see what uh, the team is kind of where the team is at as a whole. And then you can really enter into a uh, discussion with each other about how you as a team can help each other accomplish uh, your personal goals, um, how you as a supervisor like to receive some of that feedback um, about the expectations that they've set for you, and uh, a discussion about whether or not the expectations that they've set of each other are realistic. Um, and I think that's probably the most beneficial part um, of doing an activity like this is negotiating reality and setting some of those boundaries. Um, for example, if they expect you to be available 24-7, uh, obviously this may not be realistic. However, through this exercise, you now know that availability is very important to your staff. And that's the really valuable piece um, of this activity. You can then go into talking about your own availability, your own expectations around that, and help them understand how they can still get a hold of you, um, but also give them a more realistic look um, at how that will look in the long run. So ultimately, um, it's just a simple way for you to be able to get uh, those students' voices um, out there, get them to be authentic about how the year is going to look overall um, and how you would like to um, interact and set that tone uh, for the year, too. So I'm sure many of you have different op uh, different types of activities as well, but we wanted to give you that one as it's very simple and something that you can utilize with your staff as well. So with that, it's important that after we kind of set those expectations, um, as we've mentioned throughout, that we make them last, that we utilize them throughout the year. And so I'm going to let Sarah talk a little bit about how we can do that so that our expectations are not just a sitting on a shelf or sitting on a piece of paper uh, stored in our computer and not being utilized throughout the year. So 
Sarah. Thank you, Rachel. So, kind of as she had said earlier, you need to post your expectations. For instance, a colleague of mine has their student staff select a semesterly goal, personally, academically, and one in their RA job. They revisit this in their weekly one-on-one. -on -one. This includes progress, setback, and how their supervisor can help them through these goals. They also assist with keeping up with their expectations that they have posted. While discussing these goals, they also discuss the expectations that are posted and how those are met weekly. Another idea is to put one expectation in your weekly agenda as a reminder. This way, it's just a gentle reminder to let them know they need to continue doing rounds or they need to stop by your office once a week, or they need to make sure that they're early to their staff meetings. As we've discussed before, you can use them to follow up by capitalizing on that key moment when using the expectations and evaluations and assessment. Nothing should come as a surprise with your staff, as we discussed this before. When talking with their performance, utilizing the expectations and the evaluation process and assessment process makes that possible for them to have the opportunity to discuss the ongoing things that you've discussed. You can use expectations at various points throughout group development. While looking over Bruce Tuckman's stages of group development, this includes the forming, storming, norming, and performing. This works through beginning, including icebreakers and team builders, addressing your issues and problems, readdressing or reestablishing the group and then meeting the expectations by working together as a team. It is a process to bring them together, coming from interviewing to hiring them onto the staff to continuing working with them throughout the year. So making sure that you're utilizing these expectations. Your staff may change throughout the year, and it may be necessary to revisit your expectations during this time. So if there's a departmental shift or a life change or a scheduling conflict, Maybe a new hire was brought on throughout the year. You need to change your expectations as needed. So whether that be a bulletin board deadline, kind of as Rachel had mentioned previously, or if an RA is lacking during finals, you can revisit this and let them know that we need them to follow up, we need them to continue to do what they need to do during this time and get through the semester. This should be a fluid document, so when you need to make edits, change it. If something doesn't pertain anymore, then you can go ahead and edit that document. I've been here at IUPUI for a year now, and me, myself, I've been reviewing my expectations throughout the summer to ensure that next year when my staff come on, if something doesn't make sense anymore, I've taken it out and they don't need to see that. Moving on to making them last, continuing that. Do not be the sole distributor of who makes your expectations. Revisit the who and ask for feedback. You should talk with your supervisor about making sure your expectations align with your departmental goals. As well, make sure your expectations don't contradict or place additional restriction when compared to your department or institution expectations. Utilize your peers. They're great resources. Find inconsistencies, recognize them, and change them. For instance, kind of as Rachel had mentioned before, if duty check-ins at 5 p.m., make sure everyone has the same message. This way, no one gets frustrated, and it's a consistent document that you can have with your peers. If you find frustrations within your peers, this could be a topic with your one-on-one, -on -one, in your one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor. You have to create buy-in from your peers in order to have everyone on the same page. One of the best ways to make your expectations last is empowering your staff to take ownership over them. Their buy-in and understanding of the expectations is what gives them value and longevity. Creating buy-in starts with feedback by allowing the staff to assist in writing expectations. Throughout the semester, you could ask for anonymous feedback, such as a 360 evaluation. Have them evaluate themselves. Have them rank how well they think they're doing and how well their team is doing, asking for areas of growth. Then you, as a supervisor, take some time to read the expectations. Read their critique of each other and place the staff where they belong. Then form a list of what needs to be discussed in your staff meetings. Ask them what needs to happen to solve these problems. How do they assist with the changes of growth? For instance, if there's no parking or if someone isn't doing rounds properly, 
Are they parked in the correct spots that they needed to be? Or are they doing rounds at all? So if you have a way of tracking their, their rounds, whether it be them inserting that in your weekly report, or their duty log, or changing a duty sign or a board nightly. Do the resident, residents or resident assistants see them interacting with their peers in the halls at night? Giving these ideas to them gives them a visual representation of how the staff can grow together. If something comes up that you can identify that you're more, that you see that you can discuss in private, you're more than welcome to discuss this in a one-on-one -on -one instead of in the big group. This is a good pulse of the group, which provides for a conversation about conflict and challenges, thus giving the staff opportunity to facilitate these different conversations when talking about these issues in staff meetings. I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel one last time to wrap up things, discuss questions, comments, and concerns. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so obviously, uh, we only had a limited amount of time to talk to you today about expectations and how to write them, things to consider, um, and how to use them uh, throughout the year to give you some of those strategies. Uh, we also wanted to make sure, because of that, uh, to provide you with a few of the references and resources that we truly find uh, valuable uh, when embarking on this process. I think a couple that I would just like to highlight are the Keegan uh, book up at the, the top, In Over Our Heads. It's a great resource if you haven't uh, read his book yet about those societal expectations, both for our students uh, and for us as professionals as well, in thinking about our personal and professional expectations that are had of us and how we can really uh, develop that capacity uh, to meet them. And lastly, the Winston and Creamer book, um, as well as also a wonderful um, resource to pick up as uh, they have a great section in there about staff orientation and about setting expectations as well. So feel free, uh, if you would like to do some more reading, um, to explore this further, uh, to utilize some of those resources on there uh, to do that for, for yourself. Uh, with that, we would like to uh, definitely utilize the rest of our time here today uh, to hear about some of your um, best practices, hear about some common expectations uh, that you've had as well, uh, or to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we realize that expectation setting um, is something uh, that happens year-round, but that now it's probably a, a great time that it's fresh in our minds and that uh, we have a wealth of uh, resources and, and people on this call. So hopefully we can uh, begin to uh, send some of those things Zena's way uh, so start utilizing that chat box so that we can answer some of your questions uh, with the remainder of our time. But we'd also like to just thank you and provide our contact information uh, to you as well. Uh, should you have a question or uh, like some of our resources that we, we mentioned, uh, we're more than happy uh, to talk with you or connect with you uh, via email or via Twitter. Uh, we've provided our Twitter handles on there as well. So feel free to reach out and to ask us uh, anything that you may be uh, wondering about after this webinar as well. Um, we'll make sure that all of these materials are up um, on the Gwikuho website. Uh, so if you would like to reference them, uh, you'll have a chance to do that as well. So with that, I would like to um, turn it over to Zena to see if we've uh, had any questions that have come in, and we'd be more than happy to try and answer those for you. Looks like we already have a couple of questions coming in. One that came in earlier is in regards to the kind of consequences that apply when an expectation is not met. Yeah, th I would be more than happy to, to speak to a little of that. And I know we mentioned accountability a lot throughout this webinar um, and setting up those expectations so that you can set uh, or can hold your staff members accountable. Uh, obviously, if you don't have those things uh, set out ahead of time, it's, it's very hard uh, to be able to uh, actually hold your staff accountable um, as they, they don't know uh, what they did wrong. They can't read our minds uh, with what we want them uh, to do as much as we would love for them to be able to do that sometimes. Um, so part of that accountability uh, piece and part of the addressing consequences is also making that a part of your conversation. So after you've created all those expectations, a separate conversation, a subsequent conversation, um, is also what happens when these aren't met. Um, and that goes back to having your staff hold each other accountable as well. 
um, and really talking about how they want each other to address um, conflict when it comes up. If they notice uh, that someone isn't pulling their weight, so to speak, as we hear a lot from our staff members, how are they going to be able to do that? And at what point do they come to you as their supervisor to make you aware of those things? Obviously, many of our departments have a set procedures uh, for a judicial action or staff uh, follow-up, staff action, whether that comes through our department or through our HR guidelines um, in hiring. And so it's really important to review those um, as supervisors and to be upfront about that with our staff members as well. I think a lot of the time uh, we leave that to chance until something happens so that our staff members I don't know what the consequences might be. And I think it's important to be transparent um, in that process uh, so that they're aware of what might happen should they uh, fail to meet an expectation. And it's not a mystery um, along the way. So I would definitely refer to uh, what your department uh, or HR has set out in regards to those specific steps um, in following up. But I think I want to certainly emphasize uh, that transparency and having those conversations up front can be very beneficial in setting up your uh, staff for success. I wanted to touch a little bit on what Rachel had just said, uh, kind of summing it all up, having the one-on-one -on -one conversations, working on a performance improvement plan if you have one or if your department utilizes one, and document everything. I think the more you document, the clearer and easier it is to have these conversations and then going with what kind of Rachel had said earlier is what your department does or if human resources has a process following that as well. Okay, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, the next question is about where do expectations of community members come into play, for instance, um, the, the residential community as a whole? I can take this one. Here at IUPUI, what we do is we utilize roommate agreements. And so if this is how I'm interpreting the question, we have certain rooms and apartments hold each other accountable. And so what that is is we ask them to meet with our student staff and to have them go over what needs to happen within their apartment. So whether that be cleaning, dishes, noise levels, guests, and so within the expectation of their apartment holds true with the expectation of the floor. During the first floor meetings, our staff discuss this within their communities and their floors. But as well, it goes back to kind of what Rachel and I had said earlier, is having them keep expectations of each other going on a staff level. And so this keeps them accountable for their actions as well. Yeah, I think overall it's, it's very important uh, to realize that expectation setting is not just something that happens amongst RAs and amongst our, our individual staff, but is something that uh, can really help to build up the community as a whole. Uh, so making those expectations visible, uh, whether that's uh, putting up a copy of the community agreement uh, that you have. Uh, having here at DePaul, we have each and every one of our uh, residential students who come in sign an agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. so that they know what is expected of them uh, coming in before they even begin in the year. And that's part of what we use in our judicial process when we need to hold student staff accountable um, as well, so that uh, those type of things are a regular part of our conversations uh, with our residents and so that they're very aware of what role they play in the community as well. So I think it, it goes at all different levels, uh, from our students in the community, our staff, and even amongst ourselves, um, we need to talk about that too, so that it can really um, reflect the campus community as a whole. And I think there's a lot of different resources that you can use uh, to help inform that, whether you have a student code of conduct, uh, res hall handbooks. I think a lot of those areas are places where we have written down expectations uh, for our students. And so truly utilizing them and making them last once again, so that it's not just something that happens. Um, at the beginning of the year, but something that we're revisiting with our residents as well is very important. Okay, so I got a little bit of clarification on maybe the direction of this question. Um, it's talking about how um, RAs and pro staff serve the larger community and how do we know that our expectations of each other as staff are actually um, advancing the needs or the desires of the community as a whole. 
evaluation. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I think to, to build on that, um, a lot of how we can tell whether or not our expectations are, are helping and whether or not what we're doing is working is obviously, obviously through assessment. Um, and so whether that's through serving um, our residents, going around and having conversations, uh, talking to them during judicials, um, and gaining that feedback um, during, you know, a lot of times most of us I know do some, some sort of student staff uh, satisfaction surveys. Um, pulling out some of those Great. elements and seeing how they relate back to our expectations and what we're asking our staff to do uh, can be really important. Uh, that's part of that inspecting what we expect um, once again. So those expectations are not just uh, for our student staff. Obviously, our residents see how that plays out in the community as well. And so utilizing assessment as a method of making sure that their impact um, is being felt in the way we want it to be uh, can be very important. OK, so um, our next question is about length and thoroughness of expectations, uh, acknowledging that it's a lot of personal preference, but maybe um, this group's interested in knowing how long and how thorough those expectations are. So I can take this question. A lot of people, a lot of my peers, we joke back and forth with each other because my expectations are four pages long. When people look at my expectations, it's a big deal. But in reality, when going through them, it's just because a lot of things are clarified. I work with other people who have the same thing written down, but it's a page long. And so finding out what that means to you and your department, again, it's your own philosophy of what you're working with. Yeah, I think it, it truly, there truly is no right formula. Uh, I know we're often looking for that formula or for something that works uh, for us. Um, and it really is about how you can best communicate that message. Um, I know that a lot of folks have different expectations uh, for training uh, versus for during the year. And so my expectations for those two different um, times during the year look very different. Uh, my training expectations are, like I mentioned, around themes. Uh, so I have three themes, be present, take care of yourself and others, and have fun. And underneath each of those things are obviously some more detailed expectations. But those are the main things I want them to focus on. Um, and as they're probably a little bit overwhelmed um, with all the information that's coming their way, I find that really minimizing those expectations in the beginning of the year helps them to grasp onto those few core things. Uh, that I'm asking of them. And then later on, we're able to have that more in-depth conversation, involve them in that process. And my expectations are uh, slightly longer uh, and more detailed so that I can have those, ex uh, those conversations with them. And I try to make them available um, and accessible as well. So not just providing that paper copy to them, but posting that on our online website, uh, putting one on the agenda, those type of things, so that it really does resonate with them, and they can be constantly reminded of that, too. So again, it's the personal preference um, in figuring out that formatting um, and how you like to theme things, uh, if you like bullet points or paragraphs I've seen all different ways. And it's truly about how you can best communicate that message. Excellent. Um, so the next question uh, goes back to something, Rachel, that you mentioned earlier about expectations reflecting um, university mission and or environments. Um, and there was a request for some examples or a little bit more uh, articulation on that. Sure. I think, you know, as we think about our expectations, we want to make them fit where we work, as I said, right? So um, a great example of this uh, is for us here at DePaul University, uh, we're mission-centered and we work at a Vincentian institution. And that's a, a big portion of that is serving the poor and serving others. So for us, if we want our residents to take that away, this goes back to what we expect of the community as well. Um, we need to expect that of our RAs to role model that in some way. So if we ask our RAs to be a role model, in what way? How are we spelling that out about what what does it mean to be a role model? For us here at DePaul, that may connect back to mission. 
So we expect you to be a role model by engaging in service. And that's something that is reflective um, not only in our expectations, but in what type of activities uh, we're providing, what type of programs uh, that we're putting on for our hall, and what we're expecting those programs that they put on uh, to be centered around. So I think that in terms of mission, it's really pulling out um, those priorities for your institution and figuring out whether or not it makes sense uh, to connect that back to something you want your staff to do. Perhaps your staff as a whole um, does one service event per semester, per quarter, uh, one per month. Whatever works for you, that could be a really practical way to connect it back so that mission is staying at the forefront of your mind, if that's something that is important uh, to your institution. If you're not a mission-based school, if that's not something that's regularly a part of your conversations and your vocabulary, what is? Um, like I mentioned, if, if sustainability is very important to you, perhaps you're making some sort of requirement or expectation of your RAs um, to do a sustainability program to, um, you know, in some sort of practical way, reduce their waste, to promote recycling uh, within their floors. And then trying to spell that out as much as you can uh, while still allowing them to have some creativity. So it's that fine balance, once again, of walking uh, down the line um, and making sure that those expectations are truly uh, reflective of your institution and your context. And I think your supervisor, your colleagues, other people uh, throughout the university are also great uh, folks to talk to about maybe what those key things can be, especially if you're new to an institution. Okay, and then I have one more for you too so far, so if anybody else wants to contribute, we're still taking them. Um, uh, we just had a comment from uh, a staff about uh, working on a small campus and working closely with all of our student staff um, and finding that it's very important to convey to student staff that even though we have expectations for the entire department, each professional is different and student staff need to treat um, the supervisors as individuals as well. Just because one professional expects something, it doesn't mean every professional in the, the department is going to expect the same thing. I can take that one. Uh, it sounded more like a comment, but more uh, question-based. Uh, we here at IUPUI work on an extremely small campus. Uh, we only have 1,300 living on. And so with that, out of our three or four professionals, three grad students, we have to hold our departmental expectations, our campus expectations, but as well our own. And I think that's where we instill in the student staff to know who their supervisor is, obviously within reason of you know, going to other people for questions, comments, and concerns, but clarity within their building or their area or community is responsible for the expectations that you set. We all have the same ones, kind of as I mentioned before. I have four pages, other of them have one, but we do have a departmental expectation list that we all hand out. So some of my or some of my expectations may include being on time or making sure your bulletin boards have clean edges, things of that nature. Those are nitpicky things and, and that you know we can discuss at different times. But by all means, uh, it goes with understanding everyone's expectations and it's accountability through your peers. So taking time during the opportunity during training or for you know your professional staff, and reading those out loud or giving them to each other for looking over them purposes as far as critiquing them or looking over them to make sure that everyone is on the same page. If you're holding your staff to something that you know they don't ask or they don't request, it's not going to work for your building. So our communities. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No. Nope. I was going to say, different communities have different needs. So upperclassmen versus first-year students. They're different because upperclassmen are not the 17, 18-year-olds coming in. And so making sure that your expectations fit where you live. Even utilizing this in a living learning community versus a regular first-year floor. How are those different and what needs are in those buildings or environments? Even the same thing with your student staff in those areas. Are you hiring upperclassmen for those areas, or are you hiring different students? So for a living learning community, 
if it's business or education? Are you hiring those types of students to uphold those values and expectations in that area? Well, you two have uh, dominated the question list here, so we'll wait just another minute or two here and see if any, or a moment or two, and see if anybody else has any last questions or comments they want to throw in to the mix here. So while we're, we'll wrap up, and if any questions pop up, we'll answer those too. Um, I, we'd just like to say thanks to Sarah and Rachel for their outstanding session, um, and also thanks to the Professional Foundations Committee for sponsoring this webinar, particularly a timely webinar. Um, thank you all for attending as well. We hope to see you again at one of our upcoming webinars. And um, oh, here we go. Got another one. <laughs> um, are there any student comparable positions on your campuses? Student comparable. Sure. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, can you state that one more time, Zena? Sure. Are there any student comparable positions on your campus? Student comparable. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that, an answer. Uh, like other student workers, perhaps, um, potentially. Okay. If that's the case, I oh, mean, oh, okay. I, are there other RAs? Other than RAs, are student staff positions comparable to RAs? Are there comparable positions on campus yeah. um, to RAs? We have. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. All right. Here at DePaul, uh, we certainly have a comparable uh, position. We uh, have a split system where our housing services and our residential education offices are separate. And so we have facilities assistance as well. And so um, a lot of what we have to do is negotiating how our two different departments set our expectations, um, and how our student staff understand that those expectations may be very different of them. And so I think that's a very important as well and a great point to bring up that uh, those expectations may be conflicting. Uh, they may be different, uh, especially as we look at our office assistants too and how our student staff are perceiving the work uh, that each other does. So very important to highlight those expectations and to begin to understand them as a whole. I want to be cognizant of, of time, so Zena, I will uh, turn it back over to you. Excellent. Well, we've exhausted all of our questions at this point. So again, I say thank you to Rachel and Sarah for their great presentation. Applause over the phone. Um, thanks to all of you for attending again. We do hope that you'll attend one of our upcoming webinars, um, which are listed on glucuho.org slash webinars, I believe. Um, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for attending.